All right, I want to welcome everybody to our weekly Bible study. And this week we are on uh, the portion in Hebrew Parshat, the portion Shemini, which just means eighth. And this was, um, you know, remember last week we talked about the seven days that, that Aaron and his sons had to stay at the tabernacle as they were being inaugurated as priests, okay? So this is, after that seventh, this is the eighth day. And so that's where you get Shemini, which, is, which means eighth. And so we're looking at Leviticus 9 through 11, and I want to open with prayer, but this is going to be, it's going to be a great lesson. You guys are going to enjoy this, and as always, I really recommend that you, you read John Parsons' commentary because he brings a lot into it, and I know that those that follow these teachings, you, you really love the Hebrew roots, and you love understanding the, the Old Testament from a New Testament perspective like I do. That's why you're joining us in these teachings, so... Anyway, this will help you understand Leviticus. I believe it's going to be a great blessing. So let's open with prayer. P please agree with me. The Bible says that two agree on earth that God will do it. So I really appreciate you guys agreeing with me. So Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and through his blood, not in our own works of righteousness or anything like that, which are his filthy rags, but we come in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. We come through his precious blood. And we enter in with thanksgiving, and we enter your courts with praise. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to study the word. And, Lord, we love you and we praise you, that you alone are awesome and mighty and worthy of all praise. There's none like you, the Holy One. We bless you. And, Lord, we agree together. Let the heavens be open. Let your glory be here in our midst. I ask you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will move upon all of us and help us. He's our great teacher. Jesus taught us in John 14 through 16 that, Holy Spirit is our great teacher, and we ask the Holy Spirit to move upon us and give us good, fertile soil of hearts and minds and lives, anointed eyes and ears to be able to see and hear and understand maybe what we couldn't before, but the Holy Spirit illuminates it to us, helps us to see it. And Lord, I ask that um, help us to get locked in and focused and be good soil, and everything will be spoken out of my mouth that needs to be in the good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit, that will take root, grow, and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. Let the winds of your spirit carry this out everywhere it needs to go and everything be accomplished in and through it that you will be done. And we agree together. We submit all these Bible studies, Lord, everything unto you in unreserved obedience under the blood of Jesus. And we take authority. We resist the devil. We must flee. We bind up everything of Satan's kingdom that's trying to hinder, distract, confine, oppress, in any way come against the word of God being taught in any of these lessons, we bind you in the name of Jesus and we command you, we'll gather up your kingdom and come out and go right now in Jesus' name, right now. And Lord, I thank you for your mighty angels clearing all this out and let this just be a peaceful time as we love on you and we love your word and we study the precious word of God. Thank you for your word, Lord. We would be totally lost without the word of God. Thank you for sending it to us. We love you and we bless you. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... As we get into this, this is really interesting. So the eighth day, now the priesthood has been anointed and inaugurated. And the tabernacle has been set up. You have to picture, this thing is pretty big. You know, it's about half the size of an NFL football field as far as it's to the 50-yard line. But it was a big rectangle. And it, it was really large, you know. And uh, anyway, so that has been set up. The tent where the holy place and the holy of holies, that tented area there that's covered, all that's set. Everything's been anointed. Aaron and his sons were taught what to do. And so this is the eighth day. Eight is the number of new beginnings. This is the day that, that is supposed to be inaugurated right here at what's called Rosh Kodesh Nisan. Rosh Kodesh just means the head of the month. So real quickly, I think we've covered this, but the Bible shows that Israel based their calendar primarily on the lunar. So a new moon, and you, you can look this up, it's actually pretty interesting. A new moon is when that little sliver shows up, the beginning of the crescent, just that little sliver is the new moon. And that's when um, the nation of Israel began each new month is at the new moon. And that's why you read in the Bible like David and those that really honor God and love God in the Bible, they had new moon celebrations before the Lord. It was just a feast day before the Lord. So anyway, this, this was right at the new moon of Nisan. Now, in the Bible, this month was called Abib. 
but the name was changed probably in Babylonian captivity to more of a Babylonian secular name of Nisan. And this is the first of the biblical calendar, the first month of the year. And so on the first day, Moses was setting this up. He inaugurated the priesthood and he did everything he's supposed to do. They had to stay there for seven days. Now on the eighth day, they were beginning their service. Moses was overseeing it, but for the first time now, Aaron was going to be offering up the sacrifices himself. So this is what was going on. And um, this is a really interesting to study all this out. Now, let me say this. So I think it's kind of interesting and maybe prophetic that today Israel celebrates the turn of their year in the seventh month of Tishri. Now, and, and it's called the seventh month. They know it's month number seven, but still that's their new year. And it's just kind of weird that it changed to that. And I, I was, I've always wondered why in the world. But I think that it's possibly prophetic because the, the spring feast have already been fulfilled prophetically. Jesus came and died on Passover on that day. He was nailed to the cross at nine in the morning, the morning sacrifice. He was, he was there at noon because the evening sacrifice was moved back to noon because of being Passover. And that's when it grew dark and he was crying out, why have you forsaken me? And then at three o'clock would have been when the um, Passover sacrifice, and that's when Jesus died, literally was right as the Passover lamb was being killed. Jesus died at the same time while the, the high priest would have held up his hands and would have said, it's finished. Jesus had his hands spread, and he says, it is finished. So Jesus fulfilled Passover that day. Now, he was buried, and he was in the tomb for a full three days and three nights. So if you want me to rewind real quick, I'll give you a little bit of information. I'm going to have to move quickly for a second time, but but Jesus, this would have been Passover, would have been Tuesday evening this particular year, okay? And so Jesus had that Passover meal. This is where Judas was exposed. This is where Jesus initiates Holy Communion out of Passover. It's actually a Passover uh, celebration, so to speak, throughout the whole year that you can have any time. And so after that, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives area, and he's teaching his disciples because he knows Judas is coming. And he, then he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying, sweat, sweating blood. Peter, James, and John keep falling asleep on him. Anyway, Judas comes. So the next day, um, it, Passover begins that evening, okay? But the next day, Passover is going on until Wednesday evening at sunset. So that's when Jesus died. It was on a Wednesday. So he was buried Wednesday evening. And he was in the tomb on the Feast of Unleavened Bread from Wednesday evening to Thursday, one day, from Thursday evening to Friday, two days, from Friday evening to Saturday, three days. Now, Saturday is the Sabbath. Um, you know, Friday night to Saturday night is, is the weekly Sabbath. And so Jesus was in the tomb three full days. Now, the Feast of first fruits is always to take place the day after the Sabbath. So whenever Passover falls, there is the seven days of unleavened bread, okay? That's day one, the seven days. And it says, whichever day of the week that it falls on, the day after Sabbath is the first fruits. okay? So it's always going to be on a Sunday. Um, Jesus raised from the dead sometime Saturday evening and was seen early, early Sunday morning, which is the first day of the week in the, on the Bible calendar. That's why when you read in the Bible, they'll say on the first day of the week, it's always Sunday because Saturday is the Sabbath. It's the seventh day. So Jesus raised from the dead literally on first fruits. And then during the time called counting of the Omer, there's, there's 50 days that's counted. Every day it's counted. Jesus was appearing to people for 40 of those days, and he was making himself known. Then he ascended in Acts 1-8. He ascended up in the clouds, and the disciples saw him. And he said, now wait, go wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. Then you'll be my witnesses. So he basically told them, I had to have the Holy Spirit come upon me and clothe me in power to do what I did. And I'm telling you, don't just go start doing anything. You wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, okay? He already blew on them, and they received the Holy Spirit within. They were born again.
but he was telling them, you need this clothing of power. I'm going to go, but I'm going to send the comfort. I'm going to send the promise of the Father to you. Now go wait in Jerusalem, okay? And so they go, and they know the feast called Shavuot, which is Pentecost. It's the same thing. They knew that that feast took place every year and had taken place for 1,500 years, going back to Moses. So they were there in Jerusalem for those remaining 10 days, and they began to pray and seek God a lot. Well, when the day of Pentecost fully came, which is Shavuot, okay, when that feast day came, the Holy Spirit fell on that day. And so all of those spring feasts are fulfilled. It's past tense. It's done. Now we, we're in that long, dry, hot summer that we've been in. You know, we're waiting for Jesus to come back. And now we're looking for the spring, uh, the fall feast to be fulfilled. And the fall feast, or Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, which Israel calls it Rosh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is uh, um, the head of the year. But again, the Bible doesn't really call it that. The Bible says Nisan 1 is the head of the year. Okay, but that's, you know... So anyway, it's Yom Tov, the Feast of Trumpets. So every year, there's all these shofarim, the, the shofar sounding a hundred times all over the world. Shofarim are being blessed. And so it, you know how this is going to be fulfilled? There's going to be a, a catching away, a meeting in the air where there's going to be a shout. There's going to be the voice of the archangel. There's going to be a blast of a shofar that an angel is going to blast. Mind you, that's going to be a loud shofar. And it says that those of those that are alive, well, first off, the dead are going to go first. Their bodies are going to be raised to meet the Lord in the air. And um, they're going to be given their glorified bodies, those that were dead in Christ, okay, already. But those of us alive and remain, which I'm believing to be a part of that, I'm sure you are too. Those of us alive and remain, we're going to be changed in the blink of an eye. Our bodies are going to be turned into glorified bodies, and we're going to be shot up in the air. We're going to meet the Lord in the air, and it's the catching away. In the, in the Greek, it's called harpazo. Uh, some have translated it rapture. Some say catching away, the meeting in the air, whatever. It really don't make me any difference what you want to call it, but there's going to be a meeting in the air, and that those are going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that's the next feast, and I believe we're close to that. And then after that is Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Now, that's a very somber time for Israel, for those that keep this feast. It's a very somber time, and it, but it's also in Israel very anti-Christ because they're looking to be forgiven for sin while they are rejecting Jesus, their, the Messiah. They're rejecting him. But they're looking through works to be forgiven. And there's these prayers called slichot, which is like a, um, a real crying out, a real wailing and all this. And, and, but apart from the blood of Jesus, you are not going to be forgiven for your sins, okay? And so during the way this feast is going to be fulfilled is the seven-year tribulation, also called the days of Jacob's trouble. And so the, the remnant have been pulled up in the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there's going to be people that remain that are going to be in outer darkness of the tribulation, weeping and wailing. It's going to be difficult for those left behind. But um, anyway, the focus, though, is going to be back on Israel. And Israel is going to be going through a very, very difficult time. At first, it'll look good, but it's going to turn into another holocaust where two-thirds of the Jews are going to be killed. And so that's, that's the, the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Days of Jacob's Trouble. But there's going to be a glorious ending to these feasts, and that's tabernacles. This is when Jesus comes with all of us, and those that are at the marriage supper, and I'm, I'm believing you're going to be with me because I plan on being there. We're going to be coming back riding white horses. So these are going to be some massive, awesome spiritual horses that are coming out of the sky. And anyway, we're going to be riding these horses with the Lord, and we're coming in with him. He's going to slaughter the enemies of Israel, and he's going to, now it's not a meeting in the air. His feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in two. And he's going to go into Jerusalem, the temple area, and he's going to sit enthroned on the throne of his father David. And he's going to rule the whole earth, all the Gentile nations. He's going to rule the earth out of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is going to be the capital of Israel, but he's going to rule. 
and I want to be a part of that kingdom, and I will be, and I'm believing you will be too, okay? So I think maybe the reason why the, the new year is in the fall now is because those have not been fulfilled. So there's a lot of emphasis put there. Um, anyway, you'll notice in this that Aaron began to offer up the sacrifices that, that Moses told him to, but there was no fire. And so Moses, I imagine the people thought, man, maybe God hasn't forgiven us for the golden calf. But Moses and Aaron went into the holy place and they began to intercede. And after they were done interceding, they came out to the outer court and they blessed the people. Now, to this day, the way that Aaron's descendants, they hold up their hands like this, which is the sign of the letter Shin in Hebrew, which is an SH sound or an S, but it's an SH. And it's where you get things like Shalom and, and the, the Shekinah, the Shekinah, and El Shaddai, things like that. But they'll hold up their hands like this and they'll sing a blessing in Hebrew. But anyway, Aaron spoke that blessing over the people, the blessing that God gave him, which is the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace or establish you in peace. He spoke that out. And after he did, the fire came out. Now remember the tabernacle had a pillar of fire and it was down in the Holy of Holies. So somehow it came out either from the top of the, the tent or out of the Holy of Holies, but fire shot out of there in full view of the people, mind you, and came into that bronze altar and consumed the sacrifice. And the people saw it and they shouted and they fell on their face. And so God lit that initial fire. That's why in the previous lessons you read that it's taught in Jewish writings that's been passed down through the generations. It was taught that the fire on the bronze altar was not just a natural fire. There was something very supernatural about it, okay, which we've already mentioned. So God lit that fire, but he told the priesthood, it's your responsibility to keep that thing going every day. They had to get there early. Um, a priest had to kind of take off his uh, holy garments and and gather up the ash and go take it out to a clean place and dump it. And every day they had to add wood, probably at the beginning of the day, probably in the middle of the day, and probably at the end of the day. And they had to keep that fire going. And it's our responsibility as priests. God will set us on fire. He'll baptize us in the Holy Ghost and with fire. But it is our responsibility to continually let the old junk that's being burned up out of us like the ash to be cleared away every day. Get rid of it. Get rid of all the junk of yesterday. And at, rekindle the fire every day in our lives. So here's some things. How do we keep the fire burning bright in our lives? Okay, this is not an exhaustive list, but I'll give you a few things. Number one, be always quick to forgive people. Just do it immediately. Just forgive them. That day, when you, before you go to bed that night, you need to spend time in prayer and search yourself and make sure there's no unforgiveness. And if anybody has wronged you that day, forgive them. Forgive them from your heart. Remember, I told you it's from your spiritual heart, which is your belly. Really forgive them and let it go. Don't harbor any unforgiveness because that will block. That right there, if you, if you want water poured on the fire in your life, unforgiveness is one of the quickest ways to do it. Number two, I would say remain very humble. Be a humble person who is quick to repent. So if you ever sin, and the Bible says in 1 John, it says that if we say that we're without sin, we're just deceiving ourselves. None of us are perfect. But he said we have an advocate with the Father. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all the unrighteousness, to cleanse us. So be very quick. To, to repent of any sin. I mean that day. If you sin, if you say something you shouldn't have said, whatever, you don't need to go to bed without asking God to sincerely forgive you and that you repent of it. You're, gonna, you're not going to continue to do it. These are ways to keep the fire burning bright. Number three, if you wrong somebody, apologize. Go make it right. If you stole something from them, give it back. And that needs to be quick. Don't wait a long time. If you have any person that you've wronged, make sure that you make things right quickly. Number four, a lifestyle of prayer, fasting, and Bible study. You need a personal relationship with the Lord. I remember I had time with um, 
a great man of God named Steve Hill. I was able to spend some time, just him and I, and I talked to him, asked him a lot of questions. At the beginning of the conversation, though, it was really interesting to me because he wanted to make sure that I was not just religious. He wanted to make sure that I really was born again and that I knew the Lord and we had a relationship. And that changed my life. I thought that was so awesome. So he's kind of, at the beginning of it, he's kind of probing me a little bit. He wants to know. And he was asking me, so um, you you know the Lord? And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, you know, what's the Lord been speaking to you lately? And I I remember saying, well, it's so personal, but, you know, he's been talking to me about this, that, and the other. And he, he's like, okay, okay. He just wanted to make sure that that I was hearing the Lord's, because the Bible says my sheep know my voice. He wanted to make sure that I really was born of God. I was in a blood covenant, and I had a living relationship with the Lord, and I, which I did. But see, here's the thing. There's a lot of people out there, man, that they they really are not born again. They're just religious. And I'll tell you real quick, I got to make this quick, quick story that this was common in times of revival. Because see, being born again is a spiritual thing. It's supernatural. Linda Cooley was saying this older woman came up to him and she went to the Brownsville revival kind of during the early days before there was the big lines and the huge massive crowds and she just simply went into church and the revival had already started, it was really powerful. And she says she went and got her little, um, you know, information, whatever, and, and was just sitting there, and the worship started, and all of a sudden, she says she just went out in the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit just put her out. She collapsed on the ground. She was gone. And um, and, and this was actually a common phenomenon in, in times of great revival like this. And she said that she later got up off the floor, and she's this older, sweet, religious woman that, that um, was faithful to church, had never had anything like that ever happen to her before. And she got up and she realized the service was ending and this was hours later. These services weren't short. And so she's, she's contemplating this. And Lyndall asked her, said, well, that's an interesting story, but what was the outcome of this? And she said, well, I'll tell you. She said, after that experience, she said, I would, man, she said, I would go to read the Bible and it was just alive. She said, I I love, I mean, I would go to pray. She said, I felt the Lord's presence. She said, my relationship with the Lord just came alive. She said, before that, I just went to church. But now, she said, I could just pray for hours and just... See, you know what the sad thing is? That precious woman who probably lived a moral life, was very religious, and was a very good person. It is quite possible, though, that she was just religious and never truly born again. And if that's the case, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're not going to heaven when you die. It wouldn't it be sad, all the people out there, that there's, there's a large percentage that go to these churches. They know the songs and everything. They're, they're religious people, but they're going to perish in their sin one day. Matthew 7, 21, many will say to me on that day, Lord, I did all these things in your name. I did all these works and all this. And Lord's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. That's a scary scripture. It is quite possible, and I believe this to be so, that she was probably just religious, but she had an encounter with God that day. And the Holy Spirit came into her life. She was born again. And now she had a living relationship with the Lord and God really saved that woman all right so have a lifestyle prayer fasting and Bible study also get in an on fire church and be a faithful giver get somewhere where God moves you know not not just it's hyped up and exciting because anybody can do that get somewhere where the the presence and the power of God comes it may be a smaller church but find a place where God moves, where there's testimonies of people be, that were sick, that hands were laid on them, they got prayer, they're now healed. The gifts of the Spirit are in operation. Read the book of Acts and look for that type of church, okay? Go somewhere on fire for God and be a faithful giver. When God was going to send um, revival and he, it was going to come out of the Jewish people now and move out to the Gentiles, Peter was the first one that God used to go to Cornelius' house. But see, the angel of the Lord came to Cornelius. I believe this is Acts chapter 8. 
But the angel of the Lord came to Cornelius and said this, your prayers and your gifts, your um, offerings have gone up before God as a memorial offering. Now send for Peter. So great revival came to Cornelius and his family because he was a man of prayer and he was a giver. So um, those are areas I believe that, that God will really move in your life if you'll keep, if you'll be quick to forgive people, quick, be humble and quick to for, uh, repent of sin. Uh, if you wrong anybody, make it right quickly. Live a lifestyle, prayer, fasting, and Bible study for yourself. That you're growing yourself spiritually on a daily basis. You don't depend on the church. You have a relationship with the Lord. And number five, though, get in a powerful church, okay, and be a giver. All right, so those are things that I think will set you on fire and keep you on fire. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire. So let's move on. What that means is incense. So there was in the in the tabernacle, remember, there was that golden altar of incense. And so John Parsons does a great job explaining this. Aaron and his sons had been studying what God wanted them to do. And that day of the inauguration had a lot of similarities to what they were to do in Yom Kippur. You know, it was very similar. And so I guarantee you that they had been drinking. And I'll get to that in a moment as to why. And when people drink, if they get fermented wine, their mind starts getting clouded. Now, there's, there's something that's just my opinion, okay? But in the Bible, it talks about new wine and the old. And I personally believe that when the grape was first pressed, that that's the new wine. So it would have been just grape juice, basically. That's the new wine. But whenever it started fermenting, it was called the old. That's just something that I personally believe. But anyway, um, these guys had been celebrating and they had been drinking. And because of that, their minds were kind of clouded. But they, they felt that, hey, the incense is, is a really the most holy of offerings before God. And it was out of a sincere heart that they loved God. I believe that. And they, on Yom Kippur was the day that you took the incense into the Holy of Holies. I believe that they tried to take a censer and burn incense and go into the Holy of Holies, and God could not permit it. He couldn't. And so the fire, the same fire that shot out and consumed the offerings was the same fire that shot out and burned them up, consumed them. And it was very sad. And God told uh, Moses, well, I'm sorry, Moses told Aaron, but it was the word of the Lord, in Leviticus 10, 8 through 9, that they were not to be drinking and then going into ministry. And I'm, I'm really concerned about some of the, the things I've seen with people that, that are supposed to be ministers and, and the level of their drinking and stuff. It's very concerning to me. But there's a lot of inhibitions that happen. When people start drinking, they're going to do things and say things that they wouldn't have done if they weren't drinking. I'm just telling you. And I think a lot of people probably know that from personal experience, if you'll be honest. All right, so Aaron, he lost two of his sons, which is a horrible thing. And so he had two more remaining sons, Ithamar and Eliezer. Now, Ithamar, his descendants, I'm going to get into this in just a moment because I wanted to tell you, explain a little bit about uh, the ark because in the Haftar part, it talks about Uzzah died, remember, when David tried to move the ark. All right, but let me give you two more quick things. Um, Israel, the, the priesthood, the Kohanim, the priesthood, they were to, to teach Israel how to differentiate between what's holy and common. Now, we know that there's a difference between something that's holy unto God as far as its pure distinction now between something that's really evil, like maybe Satanism and witchcraft or like, um, you know, um, things that have to do with sexual immorality or something like that or murder. We know that there's, those are two different things. But what, what God was saying here was that Aaron and his sons were to teach the difference between what is holy unto God, set apart unto him, as apart to what was just um, common. And what I mean by that is this. Let's say that you have two animals. One animal was set apart during this time frame, okay, was set apart unto God for um, an offering, but the other animal was a clean animal, but it was just a farm animal. It was just common. So the people had to make a distinction. They couldn't put a yoke on this one that was holy unto God. He had to be kept separate. 
from the others. The others were just common farm animals, but this one was holy unto God. So the leadership had to teach people there's things that are set apart unto God, and you better treat them with respect and treat them differently than things that are just common, okay? And they also, the Kohanim, were responsible for teaching um, the people of Israel the word of God. It was their responsibility. And so the, the, I believe this is one of the reasons why the tribe of Levi was dispersed out among the people because the Levites lived like in these, um, these cities of refuge and stuff. They lived throughout the land among the people. And so the people um, periodically were supposed to bring their tithe to the local Levite. And so the Levite, they were able to teach the common people what to do. And so it's very important. That's, that's a principle that is carried over now into um, Christianity because there's leadership that it's our responsibility to teach people to understand the difference between what's holy as a part to what's common and to teach people the Word of God, okay? All right, now the last couple things, uh, kosher, this is, um, this is like kosher eating. Excuse me, bump that. There's uh, kosher eating. And so this probably separated the people of Israel from the Gentiles more than anything else so far. Because you could not even fellowship, you couldn't even eat with the Gentiles because their, their food source and the way that it was prepared would have been unclean. So they, they couldn't. And God did that on purpose. He was trying to keep his people separate from the heathen. And I believe that that is carried over in, in a sense, and I'll explain that. See, this probably, more than anything else, separates a true Christian, not just somebody that necessarily goes to church, but I'm talking about a true born-again, spirit-filled, a true Christian that separates us from the world more than anything else is what spiritually we feed on. The heathen, they will, they'll watch all kinds of filth on television, on the internet. They, they go hang out in the clubs and bars, the conversation. They're just, they're feeding, spiritually speaking, they're feeding themselves all kinds of filth. Spiritually speaking, they're rolling around like, like, a, like a pig in a trough. You know, they're rolling around and they're eating just whatever, just junk. But a true Christian, the Holy Spirit living in us, man, he's gonna, he's not gonna let you just watch and listen to and participate in anything anymore. So they're, they're, the heathen are going to do this, that, and the other, and you can't go because you can't participate in that. So see, that principle has carried over now into the new covenant in that there's a, a huge distinction here. This probably is one of the greatest things that separate us from the world is what are you feeding on spiritually? Because you can't go to all the movies that are out there as a true Christian. You know, there's there's different things that come on television, different things on the internet, different types of the world's music. Not not You can't listen to all the world's music. Some of it is filth. You know, I was just telling somebody the other day, I grew up in a Christian home, and, and I was saying, you know, my parents, when I was growing up, they wouldn't let me listen to the junk of the world. You know, they let me listen to um, Christian rock and all that as an alternative. But, I mean... Yeah, you have bands like Ozzy Osbourne and others. I mean, the message was what? To worship the devil, you know, to do to do drugs, you know, to go kill people. I mean, you know, this wasn't this wasn't what I need to be feeding on, right? And so they were just trying to look out for me. And I'm thankful that they did. And I, I was reading through this, it kind of made me laugh because so the Israel could eat um the, it had to have the split hoof, okay and chew the cud, which is explained really well by John Parson. And then the, the fish, they had to have both scales and fins, okay? But see, a lot of you didn't know until you read this that you could eat a grasshopper. You did not know that it was kosher in the Bible times to eat a grasshopper and a cricket. Now, I don't really know, that's not my thing. I don't know, um, what are you gonna do? Like deep fry them and eat them like potato chips, you know? I, there was a place up the road for me, no longer in business, mind you. I mean, big surprise, but it was over there by the Bass Pro Shop, and they they would sell crazy stuff like that. You know, they like 
crickets that had been cooked and then dipped in chocolate, and there was a box of them. Not my thing. I mean, that's something like little kids. You see little kids outside playing, and one of them will dare, they'll find a grasshopper, and one of them will dare, you know, you don't want to be a wimp in front of your friends. You end up eating the grasshopper, go home, and got like a little grasshopper wing right there. And, you know, your mom's like, what is that, you know? But I mean, as a grown adult, but anyway, it was kosher, Israel, they could eat grasshoppers and crickets. But there was a lot of things, though, that God said that they could not eat. And this was a huge distinction between the Gentile nations around them, okay? So that's, that's the Torah portion. Now, when you get into the Haftar, if you just give me about five or ten more minutes here, because I wanted to, to talk about this. 2 Samuel 6 through chapter 7, verse 17. David tried to move the ark. Do you remember this story? So let me give you a quick rundown of the tabernacle. So Moses inaugurates the tabernacle. Eventually, 40 years later, it's, remember, it's just moving around the desert. God just has them going in circles for 40 years until all that generation's dead. And now Joshua was preserved. He's as young, healthy, and strong 40 years later. And now he's got a, a generation that grew up, and they're... Uh, they're the ones that's going to take the promised land. So they cross the Jordan. It's like a baptism into Joshua. And um, they, they have to get circumcised at Gilgal. And they celebrate Passover. And now they conquer Jericho. Anyway, once Joshua and them go into the land and they begin their conquest, eventually they take the area of Shiloh. And Shiloh became the, the habitation for the tabernacle for a long time. I mean, it's like hundreds of years. I don't remember exactly how many off the top of my head, but it was there. And it seemed like the sons of Ithamar, they were in charge of it. And, and we get into this story in the days of David because Eli was a descendant of Ithamar. And Samuel, you know, you know the story. You just have to read all of it I, for the sake of time. I can't. But Samuel was given to the Lord's service. And so Eli raised him. And Eventually, God had to judge Eli because he would not deal with his sons. He would not get his house in order because they were wicked. His sons were wicked men. And God knew that one of them was going to become the great, uh, the high priest of Israel. And God could not have that because they were wicked. And so God had to judge Eli. And the judgment was, was that this bloodline here would be completely dealt with. And so um, Eli dies, the ark, his sons die, the ark is captured by the Philistines. Well, the Philistines took the ark and put it before their demon god, and it, the demon god falls, its head comes off, hands come off. It's a funny story. But anyway, so they have to send the ark. The Philistines don't know what to do with this, this gold box. They're just scared to death. Man, everywhere it goes, bad things happen to them. So they get two milk cows and put it on a cart, and they, they have like these gold... Uh, things in the shape of tumors or whatever they send back or rats and they just send it back to Israel they're like we apologize to your God and the God of this box because he's been really doing doing us wrong we're, we're hurting over here we should have never took his box you know and they're they feel bad so they're just sending it back but they send it back on a wood cart now the odd thing is is once Shiloh came under God's judgment the tabernacle ends up being moved next to a city called Nob. And that's where the priesthood now was functioning. So in that city, that the ark never ended up back in the tabernacle like it was supposed to. I found this very weird. But it was at somebody's house we don't know a lot about. He had to be a priest, by, by the way. But anyway, Saul comes. The, the priesthood there... Remember, they gave the consecrated bread to David and his men. And so Saul got so angry, he slaughtered all the priesthood. So again, more of the descendants of Ithamar being slaughtered, but there was a young man by the name of Abiathar, priest. And he took the, the high priest garments and he fled. And he found David out in the wilderness and he, became, he kind of stayed with David and became like David's priest. And so... The ark ended up staying where it was. The, the, the tabernacle from that point seems like it was moved up to a high place in Gibeah. That's the last that we read about anything of the movement that we know of. But you remember that Samuel would go up 
to this area and worship the Lord. That's where the tabernacle was moved to. And so Israel had to bring their offerings to where the tabernacle was. Well, David wanted the presence of God so much that he ended up going and trying to get the ark. But he, here's the story, 2 Samuel 6 and 7 through 7. David thought, well, hey, you know, the Philistines, they sent the ark back on a wooden cart, you know, and cows carried it. So he thought, well, I'll just do that. It seemed to work. Well, the problem is that God permitted it with the Philistines because they were just trying to get rid of it. But that is not at all the way the Bible said. The Bible said that it had to be carried on the shoulders of the priesthood. And so they were doing it wrong. And when the ox cart stumbled and Uzzah reached up to make sure the, the ark didn't fall off, he was struck dead because he touched the ark. And he was not a priest and he was not authorized to touch the ark. See, So David feared God. And he's thinking, well, this thing has been in somebody's house all these years. Obed-Edom, he ends up sending it to him for three months. And he hears how blessed Obed-Edom is in his house because the ark's there. So he goes and tries again. But this time, David sought God and he looked. He went to the priesthood and said, what did, what did I do wrong? And they basically, I'm sure they told him, it's not the Bible. I'm sure they told him, well, you tried to do what the Philistines did. But the Bible says that, that it's to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. So... Now, they go and do it the right way, and there was a procession that brought the ark into Jerusalem. And so David pitched a tent for it, and, um, you know, we don't hear in the Bible that the tabernacle was moved from Gibeon. Um, that could have been the last resting place that it was at. We don't know for sure. But we know that David um, charged his son Solomon to build a temple for God. So Solomon built that glorious temple, and the ark that was already in Jerusalem was put in the Holy of Holies. Things were as they were supposed to be. And Solomon removed Abiathar out of priesthood. And so all of the descendants of Ithamar were purged out of the priesthood. So now it was only the descendants of Eleazar. And that's Zadok was a descendant of Eleazar. Those were the ones that remained in priesthood all the way down to John the Baptist, who was a descendant of Aaron and should have been the high priest. But for political reasons, he wasn't. So that's the story there. But the, the thing is that Uzzah died because he touched the ark. And he wasn't authorized. Just like Nadab and Abihu tried to go in in a way that was not prescribed. And God had to strike him dead. So we need to be careful with the holy things of God. And I'll close out um, the Brit Hamashah, the New Testament, Hebrews 8, 1 through 6. And Jesus is our high priest. Okay, I just encourage you really read that, how Jesus has, has fulfilled everything. He is now our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. All right, so hopefully you guys have learned some things in this lesson. God bless you. It was great to be with you. I love doing these, and I'll see you next week.